Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were walking to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked him, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. And as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? On Easter Sunday afternoon, two dejected disciples are walking home to Emmaus, their chins on their chests, their eyes blank, faces empty. They are too stunned to think clearly. Jesus joins them incognito and asks what they've been talking about. They can hardly believe it. Where have you been? How can you not know what's going on? They explain to the uninformed stranger that a prophet had been executed. According to first century messianic ideas, Jesus' crucifixion is proof that God has rejected him. But this pair have trouble believing it. They had never known such an extraordinary person. They tell the stranger that Jesus' death is the death of their hopes. Some women are spreading stories about an empty tomb and angels, but it seems too fanciful to take them seriously. And then it is Jesus' turn to wonder how they can be so completely uninformed. Luke writes that Jesus initiates a Bible study right there on the road to Emmaus. Jesus teaches them at length what the scriptures say about how the Messiah must suffer. He lays it all out for them. And they don't get it. Jesus leads the Bible study and nothing happens. When they arrive at a nearby inn, the disciples ask Jesus to stay for supper. They still don't know who he is, but they know they want him to stay. They ask him to say grace. Jesus breaks bread, blesses it, and gives it to them. And in the middle of communion, 
their eyes are opened. And the first thing they say after Jesus is gone is, did not our hearts burn within us when he was talking about the scripture? Wasn't it extraordinary? When Jesus was telling them what the Bible said, it didn't register at all. Only in looking back did it make sense. I decided a long time ago that I don't have the right temperament for wedding rehearsals. I often find them frustrating. It's like directing kindergarten kids in a Broadway musical. Mothers get upset. Most of the wedding party is late for the rehearsal. There's always someone who doesn't show up at all. The groomsmen think they're all stand-up comedians, and they're not really very funny at all. The bride and groom are stressed out, speaking to one another in terse, clipped sentences, and then they stop speaking altogether. The obvious conclusion for everyone at the rehearsal is that this wedding will not occur. We don't learn much in advance. When I was 17 years old, I took driver training classes at my high school. I sat beside my friend Steve and to the background of our teacher droning on and on about the details of safe driving we dreamed of Corvettes. Our instructor lectured lectured about complete stops, gradual acceleration, driver courtesy. Meanwhile, we thought, would we prefer a phantom blue Corvette or the rocket red? By some miracle or mystery of circumstance, I managed to pass my road test on the first try and took to the streets of Toronto way before I was ready. Steve wasn't as lucky. Steve had trouble with parallel parking and became absolutely obsessed with it. On his second road test, he was so anxious to get to the parallel parking that he ran the first stop sign he came to. On his third attempt, he managed to parallel park almost perfectly, he said. He backed the car in gently, turned the wheel. The examiner said, fine. And in almost unbridled joy, Steve left the gear shift in reverse, stepped on the accelerator to pull out, and backed into the car behind him. On the fourth attempt, Steve passed his road test. We don't learn much ahead of time, though. The teacher at your childbirth classes explains over and over the type of breathing to do when contractions are several minutes apart and as they get closer together. And you think you are paying attention. You think you're learning all of this ahead of time. But then you're in the car racing to the hospital and you can't remember if you're supposed to be inhaling quickly and exhaling slowly or is it the other way around? You get to the hospital, your husband thinks you should be doing four short breaths followed by one long breath, but that doesn't seem right to you, and you are in no mood to follow his instructions. By the time the doctor says the baby should be here in an hour, you have all but given up any hope of remembering how to breathe. We don't learn very much as things happen. We miss things while they're happening. According to Luke, Jesus told his disciples many times that things were going to go badly in Jerusalem. Later they remembered, but at the time it didn't register. Jesus explained the scripture to the pair of disciples on the road to Emmaus. Looking back, it was marvelous, but at the time they didn't see it. We learn best when we look back. The wedding rehearsal may be a disaster, but the wedding turns out fine. The groom who wouldn't listen on Friday night is on Saturday afternoon quite eager to be reminded of his cue to walk in. When the driver's ed students who were dreaming of Corvettes in class 
actually get behind the wheel of a car, they want to hear how to brake without engaging the airbag. The expectant parents who didn't perfect the breathing routines in prenatal class will be quite attentive to the instructions of the nurse when the child starts to come. It's hard for me to believe that it will be 28 years next month that I graduated from seminary, packed my bags, and headed to Perth County. None of this was supposed to happen, of course. I was supposed to be playing right wing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Only my enthusiasm for hockey greatly overshadowed my talent to actually play the game. So I entered the ministry as a kind of second choice. 28 years is not a long time, but it's not a short time either. I've learned quite a bit. For instance, I have discovered people in the church who have a real heart for mission. There are people in the church who care deeply about the plight of folks beyond the walls of the church, whether that be in sub-Saharan Africa, around the block, or down the concession. And when someone is in need, they don't spend much time weighing the pros and cons of the situation. They lead with their hearts. They go, they give, they do what they can. I'm sure someone mentioned this 28 years ago, but it probably didn't register at the time. In 28 years, I've learned that congregational ministry is really a partnership, and that listening to people to whom you are called to serve is perhaps your first duty. Listen to their hopes and dreams, and they will listen to yours. I should have known about the importance of listening 28 years ago, but I had to discover that on my own time. We may not feel that we catch it the first time through, but we learn when we remember. And for us to be the people whom God has called to serve the world, we need to remember. The Bible is full of wonderful stories but the scriptures are not living up to their intended purpose unless they are read, remembered, and in remembering, we are changed. We may be able to quote a thousand verses of scripture by memory, but if we don't live by the Spirit that calls us to remember and live differently, it doesn't amount to very much. The Bible is the unending story of God's gracious challenge to remember and to be changed. Jesus reads the scripture to the two disciples, and it doesn't matter until their eyes are opened. Then they remember how their hearts burned within them. We don't always understand the story best when it is open in front of us. We understand when we see the truth all around us. If you listen closely to your lives, you will remember. You're sitting with friends in a restaurant, enjoying their company, when you remember in the sacred story that this is called church. You hear that a friend has decided to practice medicine in an African hospital, and remember that people like that are called saints. You read of a child who has been abused and abandoned by her parents, and you remember that Jesus calls that child the least of these my sister. You think of hopeless people you know. Young people have already given up and let some of the best possibilities slip away. Senior citizens with empty places in their hearts. Dependent people who depend on all the wrong things. And the word from Scripture seems to fit. They are lost. You notice the good gifts around you. You awaken to people who always seem to be there when you need them the most with an encouraging word or an extended hand to help. You consider all that you have in your life, neither earned or deserved, the joy of friendship, the taste of a good meal, the beauty of a sunset, the shimmering brightness of a harvest moon. And the word for it all is grace. 
The Danish theologian Søren Kierkegaard said, We live life forward by understanding it backward. Jesus read the story to two disciples on the road, and at the time it meant nothing. But later they remembered. They remembered that Jesus had given them a better way of life. We come to church every Sunday to hear the same old story. And sometimes it seems boring, even meaningless. But take the story with you when you leave. Maybe later you will remember.